Imperialism and World Economy by Nikolai Bukharin, Chapter Two: Growth of World Economy. The growth of international economic connections, and consequently the growth of the system of production relations on a worldwide scale, may be of two kinds. International connections may grow in scope, spreading over territories not yet drawn into the vortex of capitalist life. In that case, we speak of the extensive growth of world economy. On the other hand, they may assume greater depth, become more frequent, forming, as it were, a thicker network. In that case, we have an intensive growth of world economy. In actual history, the growth of world economy proceeds simultaneously in both directions, the extensive growth being accomplished for the most part through the annexationist pol policy of the great powers. The extraordinarily rapid growth of world economy, particularly in the last decades, is due to the unusual development of the productive forces of world capitalism. This is directly expressed in technical progress. The most important technical acquisition of the last decade is the production of electrical and energy in various forms and its transmission over distances. The transmission of electrical energy over a distance rendered production, to some extent, independent of the place where the energy is generated. The latter may be utilized where, not long ago, this was absolutely impossible. This applies, first of all, to the utilization of water power for the production of electrical energy, white coal appearing now side by side with black coal as the major factor in the technical production process. Water turbines have come into existence, furnishing energy in previously unheard of quantities. The technique of electricity has exercised an unusually great influence also on the development of steam turbines. Electric light application of an electrotechnical process in the metallurgic industry, etc., must be noted. Internal combustion motors have also acquired a tremendous influence over economic life. The gas motor received a great impetus for development when it became possible economically to utilize the gases of the blast furnaces. Fluid substances here also play the role of sources of energy, primarily kerosene and benzene. The diesel motor has become of general use, manifesting a tendency to replace the old steam engine as antiquated. The use of overheated steam, numerous discoveries in the application of chemistry, particularly in the dyeing business, a complete revolution in transportation facilities, transportation by electricity, automobiles, wireless telegraph, telephone, etc., complete the general picture of a feverishly rapid technical progress. Never has the union of science with industry achieved greater victories. The rationalization of the productive process has assumed the form of very close cooperation between abstract knowledge and practical activity. Special laboratories are established in large plants. A special profession of inventors is being developed. Hundreds of scientific societies for the advancement of special fields of investigation and research are being formed. The number of patents applied for may serve as a certain indication of technical progress. Together with technical progress, the quantity of extracted and manufactured products increases. The figures relating to the so-called heavy industry are in this respect most indicative since with the growth of social productive forces, they are continually being regrouped in a way as to give preponderance to the production of constant capital and particularly of its basic part. The development of the productivity, productivity of social labor pro proceeds in such a way that an ever greater part of that labor is applied to prep preparatory operations for the production of the means of production, the production of means of consumption, on the contrary, is limited to a relatively diminishing portion of society's labor as a whole. 
and this is the reason why the quantity of the means of consumptions as use values grows in natura in monstrous proportions. Economically, this process expresses itself, among other things, in an ever higher organic composition of social capital. In a continuous growth of the constant capital as compared with the variable capital, and in a lowering of the rate of profit. But while capital divided into a constant and a variable part continually increases its constant part, the latter reveals an unequal growth of its component value elements. If we divide the constant capital into fixed and circulating capital, to the latter as a general rule, the variable capital belongs. There will be revealed a tendency to an ever greater increase of fixed capital. In its essence, this is an expression of the law according to which, taking the growth of the productivity of labor as a prerequisite, the preliminary production operations, the production of means of production, absorb an ever greater part of social energy. This explains the gigantic growth of the mining and metallurgic industries. If the degree of a country's industrialization serves as a general indication of its economic progress, then the specific weight of a country's heavy industry may serve as an indication of the economic growth of an industrialized country. This is why the rise of the economic forces of world capitalism finds its most striking expression in the growth of the heavy industries. Thus, in a period of a little over 60 years, beginning from 1850, the production of coal has increased more than 14 times, the production of iron ore more than 12, 12 times, that of cast iron over 13 times, that of copper more than 19 times, that of gold over 13 times. Huge masses of products are being thrown out of the production process to enter into the channels of circulation. The old markets could not have absorbed a hundredth part of what is now absorbed by the world market every year. The world market presupposes not only a certain level of development of production in the strict sense of the word, one of its material conditions of existence is the development of the transportation industry. The more developed the transport facilities, the faster and the more intensive the movement of commodities. The faster is the process of, wheel of welding together the individual, local, and national markets. The faster is the growth of the world economy's production organism as a unit. Such is in modern economic life the role of steam and electric transportation. The railroad mileage by the middle of the, the last century was 38,600 kilometers. By 1880, the figure grew to 372,000 kilometers. Since then, the length of the railroad tracks has grown with astounding rapidity. During 20 years, from 1890 to 1911, the length of the railroad tracks increased 1.71 times. The same development may be observed in the merchant marine. Marine transportation, be it noted, plays an exclusive role since it al alone facilitates the movement of commodities from continent to continent, but its role is also greatly due to its comparative cheapness even as far as Europe is concerned. According to Harms, the tonnage of the world merchant marine grew 55.6% between 1899 and 1909 alone. This gigantic growth of marine transportation has made it possible to unite the economic organisms of several continents and to revolutionize the pre-capitalist methods of production in the most backward corners of the world commodity circulation in astounding proportions. The latter, however, is accelerated not in this way alone. In reality, the entire movement of the capitalist mechanism is much more complicated since commodity circulation and the rotation of capital do not necessarily presuppose that commodities are changing their place in space. Within the rotation of capital and metamorphoses of commodities, which are a part of that rotation, the mutation process of social labor takes place. These mutation processes may require a change of location on the part of the products, the transportation from one place to another, Still, circulation of commodities may take place without their change from place to place, 
and a transportation of products without the circulation of commodities or even without a direct exchange of products. A house which is sold by A to B does not wander from one place to another, although it circulates as a commodity. Movable commodity values such as cotton or iron remain in the same warehouse at a time when they are passing through dozens of circulation processes when they are bought and sold by speculators. That which really changes its place here is the title of ownership, not the thing itself. Similar processes take place also in modern times in gigantic proportions due to the, de the development of the most abstract form of capitalism, to the ever-growing and personal character of capital, to the growth of the volume of stocks and bonds as an expression of the form of property that is characteristic for our times, in a word, due to the growth of stock capi capitalism or finance capitalism. The international leveling of commodity prices and of stock and bond values is accomplished by wire, activities of the stock and commodity exchanges. The network of telegraphs grows with the same feverish tempo as the means of transportation. Of particular importance is the increase in the length of cables connecting various continents. By the end of 1913, there were 2.547 cables. The number has already increased to 2,583. The length of all these cables were 515,578 kilometers. The length of the cables is equal to half the length of all the railroads of the world, which in 1911 was 1,057,809 kilometers. Thus, there grows an extremely flexible economic structure of world capitalism, all parts of which are mutually interdependent. The slightest change in one part is immediately reflected in all. <clears throat> Let us now examine the process itself. We have seen that the most primitive form in which economic interdependence expresses itself in a system of commodity economy is exchange. The category of world prices expresses this interdependence on a world scale. An outward expression of the same phenomenon is the international movement of commodities, international trade. Thus, within eight years from 1903 to 1911, international trade increased 50%, a very substantial increase indeed. The quicker the pulse of economic life, the faster the growth of the productive forces. The wider and deeper goes the process of internationalization of economy. W. Sombart's thesis of the diminishing importance of international relation, relations is, therefore, absolutely incorrect. This most paradoxical of modern econ economists had paid a certain tribute long before the war to the imperialistic ideology which, he said, strives towards economic autarky and creates a large self-sufficient whole. His theory is the generalization of the fact that the home sale of manufactured goods in Germany grew faster than the export of such goods. It is from this fact that Sombart drew a queer conclusion concerning the diminishing significance of foreign trade in general. However, as Harms correctly remarks, even assuming that manufactured goods gravitate towards the internal market more than towards foreign markets, a conclusion to which Sombart arrives from the analysis of German data only, one must not, on the other hand, overlook the increasing import of raw materials and foodstuffs which serve as a prerequisite for the home trade in manufactured goods for the internal market since it is due to such an import that the country is not compelled to waste productive forces on the production of raw materials and food. Definite conclusions can be drawn only after an analysis is made of both sides of the international exchange and of the distribution of productive forces in all the branches of social production. The tendencies of modern development are highly conducive to the growth of international relations of exchange, and with them many others, in that the industrialization of the agrarian and semi-agrarian countries proceeds at an unbelievably quick tempo, 
a demand for foreign agricultural products is created in those countries and the dumping policy of the cartels is given unusual impetus. The growth of world market connections proceeds apace, tying up various sections of world economy into one strong knot, bringing ever closer to each other hitherto nationally and economically secluded regions, creating an ever larger basis for world production in its new, higher non-capitalist form. If the international movement of commodities expresses the mutation process in the socio-economic world organism, then the international movement of the populations expresses mainly the redistribution of the main factor of economic life, the labor power. Just as within the framework of national economy, the distribution of labor power among the various production branches is regulated by the scales of wages which tend to one level. So in the framework of world economy, the process of equalizing the various wage scales is taking place with the aid of migration. The gigantic reservoir of the capitalist new world absorbs the superfluous population of Europe and Asia from the pauperized peasants who are being driven out of agriculture to the reserve army of the unemployed in the cities. Thus, there is being created on a world scale a correspondence between the supply and demand of hands in proportions necessary for capital. In 1912, 711,446 emigrated from Italy, 467,762 from England and Ireland, 175,567 from Spain, 127,747 from Russia, etc. To this number of final emigrants, i.e. of workers who relinquish their fatherland forever and look for a new country, must be added a number of emigrants of a temporary and seasonal character. Thus, the Italian emigrants are mostly of a temporary character. Russian and Polish workers immigrate into Germany for agricultural work. These ebbs and flows of labor power already form one of the phenomena of the world labor market. Corresponding to the movement of labor power as one of the poles of capitalist relations is the movement of capital as another pole. As in the former case, the movement is regulated by the law of equalization of the wage scale. So in the latter case, there, ta there takes place an international equalization of the rates of profit. The movement of capital, which from the point of view of the capital exporting country is usually called capital export, has acquired an unrivaled importance in modern economic life so that some economists like Sartorius von Walterschausen define modern capitalism as export capitalism. We shall touch upon this phenomenon in another connection. At present, we only wish to point out the main forms and the approximate size of the international movement of capital, which forms one of the most essential elements in the process of internationalizing economic life and in the process of growth of world capitalism. Export capital is divided into two main categories. It appears either as capital yielding interest or as capital yielding profits. Inside of this division, one can discern various subspecies and forms. In the first place, there are state and communal loans. The vast growth of the state budgets caused both by the growing complexity of economic life in general and by the militarization of the entire national economy makes it ever more necessary to contract foreign loans to defray the current expenses. The growth of large cities, on the other hand, demands a series of works, electric railways, electric light, sewage systems and water supply, pavements, central steam heat, telegraph and telephone, slaughterhouses, etc., etc., which require large sums of money for their construction. These sums are also often obtained in the form of foreign loans. Another form of capital export is the system of participation, where an enterprise, industrial, commercial, or banking, of country A 
holds stocks or bonds of an, in, of an enterprise in country B. A third form is the financing of foreign enterprises, creating of capital for a definite and specified aim. For instance, a bank finances foreign enterprises created by other institutions or by itself. An industrial enterprise finances its branch enterprise, which it allows to take the form of an independent corporation. A financing society finances foreign enterprises. A fourth form is credited without any specified aim. The latter calls for financing, extended by the large banks of one country to the banks of another country. The fifth and last form is the buying of foreign stocks, etc., with the purpose of holding them, compare activities of banks of issue, etc. The last of the enumerated forms differs from the others in that it does not create a lasting community of interests. In various ways, there thus takes place the transfusion of capital from one national sphere into the other. There grows the intertwining of national capitals. There proceeds the internationalization of capital. Capital flows into foreign factories and mines, plantations and railroads, steamship lines and banks. It grows in volume. It sends part of the surplus value home where it may begin an independent movement. It accumulates the other part. It widens over and over again the sphere of its application. It creates an ever thickening network of international interdependence. Leroy Beaulieu computes for 1902 the figure of French capital invested in foreign enterprise and loans as equal to 34 billion francs. In 1905, the figure had already reached 40 million francs. The total value of stocks and bonds in the Paris Stock Exchange was, for 1904, 63,990 million francs in French securities, plus 66,780 million francs in foreign securities. For the year 1913, the respective figures were 64,000 104 and 70,761. English capital invested in foreign countries, including English colonies, amounted at the beginning of 1915, according to Lloyd George's statement, to four billion pounds sterling. As to Germany, figures related to the placing of foreign securities and to the quotation of foreign securities on the German stock exchange show a decline of the latter, according to the statistics Jar Jarbuch für das Deutsche Reich for 1913, the nominal value of admitted securities was in 1910, 2,242 million marks, in 1911, 1,208 million marks, in 1912, 835 million marks. But this seeming decline in capital export is explained by the fact that the German banks are buying securities in increasing quantities at the foreign exchanges, especially in London, Paris, Antwerp, and Brussels, and also by the financial mobilization of capital for the purposes of war. The total of German investments abroad amounts to some 35 billion marks. The United States, while importing large amounts of capital, exports considerable quantities of it into Central and South America, especially into Mexico, Cuba, and Canada. The finance system of Cuba was the first to attract the attention of the capitalists of the United States. Americans own large plantations in Cuba. American enterprise helped considerably in developing the neighboring Mexican Republic particularly in building and utilizing the Mexican railroads. It was natural that the Mexican 5 and 4% loans, amounting to $150 million, should have been placed on the market of the United States. The 4% loan of the Philippine Islands was also placed on the American market. In Canada, the United States placed over $590 million. In Mexico, over $700 million. Even such countries as Italy, Japan, Chile, and other, others play an active part in this great migration of capital. 
The general direction for the movement is, of course, indicated by the, differ the difference in the rates of profit or the rate of interest. The more developed the country, the lower is the rate of profit. The greater is the overproduction of capital, and consequently, the lower is the demand for capital and the stronger the expulsion process. Conversely, the higher the rate of profit, the lower the organic composition of capital, the greater is the demand for it, and the stronger is the attraction. In the same way as the international movement of commodities brings the social and national prices to the one and only level of world prices, in the same way as migration tends to bring the nationally different wage scales for hired workers to one level, so the movement of capital tends to bring the national rates of profit to one level, which tend tendency expresses nothing but one of the most general laws of the capitalist mode of production on a world scale. We must dwell here with great detail on that form of capital export which expresses itself in participating in and financing of foreign enterprises. Within the framework of world economy, the concentration tendencies of capitalist development assume the same organizational forms as are manifest within the framework of national economy. Namely, there come more strikingly to the foreground the tendencies towards limiting free competition by means of forming monopoly enterprises. It is in this process of forming monopoly organizations that participation and financing play a, large, a very large part. If we were to follow up participation in its various stages to be judged by the number of acquired shares, we would realize how complete fusion is gradually being prepared. When you own a small number of shares, you can take part in shareholders' meetings. When you own a greater number of shares, you establish a closer contact with the enterprise. You can try to share with the enterprise new production methods or patents. You can speak of dividing the market, etc. A certain community of interests is thus established. If you own more than 50% of the shares, your participation already amounts to complete fusion. Quite widespread is the practice of establishing branches in the form of nominally independent corporations whose funds, however, are held by their mother corporation. The latter phenomenon is often observed in international relations. To avoid legal obstacles in a foreign country and to be able to use the privileges of native industrialists in the new fatherland, branches are being established in those countries under the guise of independent corporations. Thus, the cellulose factory of Waldorf in Mannheim has, or we may now use the past tense, a Russian branch in Pernov. The bronze paint factory Karl Schlenk Incorporated in Nuremberg has an American daughter corporation. The same is true of Varzener Papier Fabrique, which has an American branch known as the Hammerville Paper Company. The largest cable enterprise on the continent, the Westfalish Draht Industry, has a daughter corporation in Riga, etc. Conversely, <clears throat> foreign corporations have branches in Germany and other countries. For instance, the Magi Corporation of Kemptal, Switzerland, has branches in Singen and Berlin, Germany, also in Parent Paris. Compagnie Maggie and Société des Poissons Hygiéniques. In 1903, the American Westinghouse Electric Company with Pittsburgh organized a branch near Manchester, England. In 1902, the American Diamond Match Company, having gradually increased its participation in an enterprise located in Liverpool, finally absorbed it and reduced it to the state of a branch of the American main firm etc. The same is true of numerous Swiss chocolate factories and weaving enterprises, English soap factories, machine shops and twine factories, American sewing machine factories, machine plants, etc. One must not think, however, that participation in foreign enterprises is limited to this form alone. In reality, there are a great many forms of participation of various degrees from ownership of a comparatively insignificant number of shares, particularly when a given enterprise, commercial, industrial, or banking, 
participates simultaneously in several enterprises to ownership of nearly all the shares. The mechanism of participation consists in the fact that a given corporation issues its own stocks and bonds with the purpose of acquiring the securities of other enterprises. Leafman distinguishes three forms of such substitution of securities, which he classifies according to the aim of the competitive substituting corporations. Investment trust, where the substitution of securities is made with the purpose of receiving dividends from more lucrative, if more risky, enterprises. Oh, that was one. And two, placement societies, whose aim it is to place the securities of enterprises whose stocks and bonds, in consequence of legal or material difficulties, cannot be placed in the hands of the public directly. And three, holding companies which buy up the securities of various enterprises, eliminating them from circulation and replacing them by securities of the holding company, which thus acquires influence over these enterprises without spending its own capital. The aim is clearly influence, control, i.e. practical domination over given enterprises. In all these cases, it is assumed that the securities to be replaced are already in existence. Where the latter have to be created, we have before us the financing operation which, as we have seen, may be carried out by banks, industrial and commercial enterprises, also special financing companies. Insofar as the financing is done by industrial enterprises, it is ordinarily connected with the establishment of foreign branches, since it is there that the new securities are being issued. The financing enterprises may have a very wide range of activities. Thus, the mechanical enterprise Orenstein Copel Arthur Copel, Incorporated, has founded 10 daughter companies, of which the largest are located in Russia, Paris, Madrid, Vienna, and Johannesburg in South Africa. The firm of Corting Brothers in Hanover has branches in Austria, Manchuria, France, Russia, Belgium, Italy, Argentina. Numerous German cement plants have daughter companies in the United States. German chemical plants have branches in Russia, France, and England. The Norwegian nitrate enterprises are to a very large extent financed by foreign capital. The Norwegian, French, and Canadian capitalists have formed the Norsk Hydroelectric, uh, I don't know, also known as Société Norvégienne de l'Azote et des Forces Hydroélectriques, which in its turn has founded two companies with participation also of German capital. The greatest internationalization of production has been attained in the electrical industry. The Siemens Halsk firm has its enterprises in Norway, Sweden, South Africa, and Italy. It has branches in Russia, England, and Austria. The famous Algamin El Electric something something, for short IEG, has its daughter companies in London, Petrograd, Paris, Genoa, Stockholm, Brussels, Vienna, Milan, Madrid, Berlin, in American cities, etc. Similar activities are shown by the Thomson Houston Company and by its successor, the General Electric Company, by the Singer Manufacturing Company, the Dunlop Pneumatic Tire Company, etc. The large banks naturally play a very large part in financing foreign enterprises. A glance at the activity of those institutions shows how strong the international connections of national organizations have already grown. A 1913 report of the Société Générale de Belgique declares its national securities to be equal to 108,322,425 francs, whereas its foreign securities were equal to 77,899,237. The latter capital is invested in inter enterprises and loans of such diverse countries as Argentina, Austria, Canada, China, Congo, 
Egypt, Spain, the United States, France, Morocco, New Caledonia, Russia, etc. Data concerning the activities of the German banks have been worked out in great detail. Of course, it is not the German banks alone that develop such intensive activities abroad. A comparison of figures would show that England and France are in the lead, while the foreign banks of German origin numbered only 13 by the beginning of 1906, with 100 million marks of capital and 70 branch banks. England possessed by the end of 1910 36 colonial banks with branches in London, and with and with 3,358 local bureaus in the colonies. Also 36 other banks in foreign countries with, with 2,091 branches. France in 1904 to 1905 possessed 18 colonial and foreign banks with 104 branches. Holland, 16 foreign banks with 68 branches, etc. Individual banks of France also show great economic power in relation to the colonies and foreign countries. Thus, in 1911, the Credit Lyonnais had about 16 branches abroad and five in Algeria. The Comptoir National des Comptes had 12 branches abroad and um, in Tunis and Madagascar. The Société Générale and the Credit Industrial have branches only in London, but on the other hand, they have numerous daughter companies abroad. Participation and financing as a further step in participation signify that industry is being molded to an ever-growing degree into one organized system. The most modern types of, of capitalist monopoly in their most centralized forms, like the trusts, are only one of the forms of, our, of participating companies or financing companies. They enjoy a more or less monopolistic ownership of the capitalist property of our times, and they are looked upon and classified from the point of view of the movement of securities as a specific expression of the capitalist property of our times. We thus see that the growth of the world economic process, having as its basis the growth of productive forces, not only calls forth an intensification of production relations among various countries, not only widens and deepens general capitalist inter interrelations, but also calls to life new economic for formations, new economic forms unknown to the past epochs in the history of capitalist development. The beginnings of the organization process that characterizes the development of industry within national economic boundaries become ever more evident also against the background of world economy relations. Just as the growth of productive forces within national economy on a capitalist basis brought about the formation of national cartels and trusts, so the growth of productive forces within world capitalism makes the formation of international agreements between the various national capitalist groups from the most elemental forms to the centralized form of an international trust ever more urgent. These formations will be the object of our inquiry in the next chapter.